Yeah, so good morning, everyone. Um, as mentioned, the title of our talk today is DFI on 2022, Digital Forensics and Incident Response, the Wild Wild East. We've entitled it this way because the vast majority of incidents that we've seen this year have come from Eastern Europe, I have to say, certainly a trend. Look, I'm sure there's threat actors in the other parts of the world that are just as active, um, but generally their motivations are more along the lines of political or perhaps espionage. And they're certainly not as loud as Eastern European threat actors, which are very much financially motivated at this point in time. We want you to know that they've been in your network because you need to be able to read the ransom notes so you can pay the ransom, essentially. Quick introductions. My name is Jack. I'm the Chief Technology Officer at Triscale Labs. We've got Rich here as well. He leads our DFIR team. A bit of background on Triscale Labs quickly. We run three major branches of our business, uh, advisory, defensive and offensive, which is basically GRC, 24 by 7 Security Operations Center, and the offensive team for pen testing and red teaming. Under the defensive team, we have a digital forensics and incident response team as well, which we'll be talking about today. Quick overview of the agenda. So we'll have a look at the high level overview of the attacks that we've seen over the course of this year, the major two types of attacks being ransomware and business email compromise. Um, these are the attacks where the businesses in Australia really have felt the effects and experienced subsequent financial loss, at least very much in the short term. We'll do a deep dive in a case study on a particularly effective ransomware incident that we responded to by a ruthless threat actor. And then we'll look at the top takeaways as well for how organizations can protect themselves. Before we dive in, I wanna reiterate some of the uh, takeaways, things to remember while we talk today. Look, nothing we're talking about today is particularly sophisticated. Uh, as I'm sure many of you know, it's the low hanging fruit that get targeted and those are what we're responding to. So it's pretty simple things that organizations can do to protect themselves, things like multi-factor authentication being in place, uh, poor backups, or sometimes good backups, but they're not segregated, so they're really poor backups. A lot of organizations don't really have the IT resources needed to implement the right security controls, or maybe they have an MSP whose focus is not security. And threat actors, particularly in the ransomware space, they're becoming more and more efficient and quick and effective at privilege escalation, lateral movement, uh, and subsequent execution of ransomware. So we'll have a quick look at the types of engagements and the industry verticals that we've conducted. 34% business email compromise, as we can see, the majority is ransomware and extortion. Few incidents where it's only ransomware and a few where it's only extortion, but the vast majority is certainly these two things being combined. So the threat actor will get in, they'll steal the sensitive information first, and then they'll encrypt the business critical data. They'll perform a double extortion attack try to get the organization to pay for both the decryption keys and to prevent the data being released on the web. The industry verticals that we've responded to varied, certainly varied. Healthcare is the biggest one, um, but I think the major takeaway from this slide is to understand that no one industry is really being targeted here. It's more about the low hanging fruit particularly financially motivated threat actors are opportunistic. They want to make as much money as possible as fast as possible. So they'll just target the weakness, the weak organizations rather than targeting specific verticals. With that, I'll hand over to Rich quickly, who's going to talk about ransomware, give a bit of an introduction. Thanks, Jack. So when we're talking about ransomware, we're essentially talking about a threat actor running encryption um, software or ransomware binary on one or more systems within uh, a network. And what that binary will do is go through the file system and encrypt files on it, make them inaccessible to users. So the only way you can get that data back is either pay for a decryption key or have really good backups. Um, a lot of the time, the uh, ransom note will be built into the uh, ransomware binary as well. And that's uh, littered across uh, the drives where it's encrypted. And that will include information about the threat actor, um, that most of them maintain websites on the dark web where they will um, list their victim organization. So there'll be links to that, uh, instructions on how to download Tor so you can actually visit the site. And also often a unique 
uh, company ID for the victim organization. So if they choose to engage with a threat actor, they'll be able to identify who that organization is. As Jack mentioned, double extortion is something we see a lot. So threat actors stealing data prior to encrypting it. And the reason for this is that it puts additional pressure on that organization to pay the ransom. So they may have really good backups and they can simply restore from backups. They might be down for a couple of weeks. They might have some business interruptions, um, but they're, they're able to get back up and running. However, if the threat actor stolen, potentially PII data, PHI data, IP data for um, how that company operates, they may not want that to be made publicly available and that may uh, entice them to negotiate with the threat actor. On the screen, we've got a, a screenshot here of Black Bastard's uh, blog that they maintain. So it'll list the, the, the victim organizations here, um, a bit about the company and then uh, the published uh, percentage. So they will release uh, exfiltrated data in stages if the ransom is not paid. And they also track the, the number of people that have uh, clicked on the site as well. Two more examples here. So on the left, we've got Hive Leaks. This is the, the Hive ransomware group. Uh, they will include information about when they actually encrypted uh, that victim organization and when they posted it on their website. And on the right is Lockbit, uh, probably one of the more well-known ransomware groups in the moment. They operate a, a very effective ransomware as a service uh, operation where they will let uh, threat actors utilize their uh, ransomware tools they'll let them use their back end and they get a cut of any successful ransom. Um, so they've got the big red countdown timer at the top where essentially if that reach, uh, reaches zero, then the, the data becomes available. So as part of the investigations that we do, we like to track um, the time between the initial access when they first got into the environment and when they deploy their ransomware. This is also, also uh, often known as dwell time. So essentially the, the key takeaway here is it's about 20 days on average um, across the threat actors that we've seen. The most extreme one here on the left is unknown. So that's where we uh, were dealing with threat actors that weren't affiliated with any major groups. And that's about 80 days. And then we can see Conti, Lockbit 2.0 before they rebranded uh, and Phosphorus is all sort of around the 45 to 35 day mark. And then we start getting to sort of sub five days with um, things like Lockbit 3, Diavol, Black Bike Cuba, and Black Basta, which will uh, do the deep dive on, and also Dharma. So we also like to get an understanding of how threat actors got into the environment. That way we can provide guidance to that um, organization to stop it from happening again. Unfortunately, the largest um, initial access vector was proxy shells. So if you're not familiar with proxy shells, it was a group of vulnerabilities in Microsoft Exchange, particularly on-premise um, hosted servers. And this came out in August uh, last year. Um, and unfortunately, it's still being exploited today, um, this year with organizations. Uh, essentially, exploiting that vulnerability gives a threat actor uh, system level access on that machine. So very useful uh, initial access point into the environment. Exposed RDP, so that's the remote desktop protocol, uh, proprietary Windows uh, protocol, and it allows you to connect to a machine, use a mouse and keyboard as if you were sitting in front of it. Um, unfortunately, exposing RDP to the wider internet is not a great idea. Um, users can... <laughs> Threat actors will try and brute force accounts, particularly the administrator account, um, which by default doesn't lock out, so they can just keep on hammering it. Um, but also if they're able to get valid user credentials through phishing or um, some other method, they can just log straight in because by default, um, the traditional RDP doesn't have MFA. So it makes it very easy. Undetermined, so this is where we will group um, initial access where we believe we know the way, but we don't have the actual evidence to prove it, or um, the environment has been wiped before we are brought into the investigation, which does happen. Um, and also if the threat actors have just encrypted absolutely everything, 
um, specifically when they uh, target hypervisors and the virtual hard drives or BMDK files are encrypted, we can't even access those to get an understanding of what happened um, on those machines. Log4j, um, specifically VMware Horizons, the Log4j is a um, Java logging library, um, very, very popular, it's open source, used by a lot of software. And in December last year, it was identified that there was quite a big vulnerability within that and it um, had a very widespread effect on uh, the IT industry. Um, in particular, we've got the, the VMware Horizons there. So that's an external facing uh, server connected to the internet. And by exploiting that particular vulnerability, threat access can again get system level access on that machine. Um, interestingly, with all the uh, Log4j VMware Horizon engagements we've had, there's been evidence of crypto mining occurring on these servers um, from January, January, February, um, until a ransomware group gets in and then essentially ransoms the network. Phishing, so the delivery of malicious uh, files through email uh, and router vulnerabilities as well. So we actually had a recent engagement where the organization had a Draytech router um, and vulnerabilities were uh, available for that, which they exploited and essentially set up port forwarding in the router, and then they could access RDP um, from externally and brute force one of the machines on the network. Jack, to talk about business email compromise. Yeah, so we won't spend too much time on this, as the majority of things we've seen have been ransomware, but it is important to talk about this type of attack. It's quite a simple one. It should be said, uh, but it can be quite effective, even though it only involves a threat actor gaining access to a single account, often usually of a low privilege user. Um, we see this often resulting in the transaction of you know hundreds of thousands of dollars uh, that can be lost. So quick slide on what this is. It's essentially when a threat actor gains access to a mailbox, ideally the mailbox of uh, some kind of financial administrative position within an organization, someone who handles invoices. And they'll sit there undetected, they'll lay in wait sometimes for a few weeks, and they'll wait for an invoice to come through. They'll intercept the invoice unbeknownst to the owner of the mailbox, and they'll change the bank account details on that invoice so that the legitimate party paying the invoice actually pays a threat actor bank account instead of the legitimate bank account. Uh, a few stats here on the screen from the ACCC in 2021. Um, they reckon that $2 billion in 2021 was lost to scams and $227 million of that was payment redirection scams, which includes business email compromise. So how are the threat actors actually getting access to the mailbox? Nothing groundbreaking, but particularly effective techniques. The first one being phishing, pretty obvious. Uh, generally, this is when they'll send a malicious link to a user that points to a phishing page to collect credentials, such as this page on the screen, right? Looks like a Microsoft Office 365 login, but they use it to collect a username and password instead. Worth noting that tools certainly do exist that can collect two-factor authentication uh, tokens and codes as well. One of the most popular is probably Evil Gen X2. Very effective tool that man in the middles the connection somewhat and then passes the creds to the legitimate service so that the session token can be intercepted as well. They can get access to accounts protected by 2FA. Worth mentioning as well, the other major technique threat actors are using to gain access to mailboxes, uh, credential stuffing. For those of you that aren't familiar, this is where a third party organization completely unrelated to the business or to Office 365 will be compromised. The data will be posted online, the credentials from that breach. And because of user tendencies to share passwords across multiple services, the passwords for the third party site will be valid for Office 365 as well and subsequently provide access to a mailbox. This next page is simply what it looks like um, when a password is entered into such a phishing page, right? You can see the password testing day sent in plain text to the threat actor. Um, a quick few notes as well as to how the threat actor achieves not being noticed within the mailbox, they'll generally set up forwarding rules, email forwarding rules. So everyone has a folder called RSS feeds, for example, that no one really uses, 
So a common technique is to set up a rule so that when certain emails come in with invoices, it gets marked as read, it gets put in that folder. When the threat actor logs in and checks in, they can see these emails that have come through and they can either forward them to the legitimate parties or they can intercept and change the bank account details. On this slide here, we can see an example of one such threat actor email where they've intercepted an invoice and they've forwarded the email on to the legitimate party to try and get the invoice paid with the fake bank account details. In this particular instance, the threat actor had actually successfully pre-authorized two different payments using this method, totaling about $300,000. But luckily, a third party organization who was about to pay this picked up the phone, called the victim and confirmed whether or not it was legitimate. And just by a phone call, saved themselves 300 grand. I mean, that's not too bad. You can see the importance of having these processes in place. So I'll hand back over to Rich. He's going to deep dive into a ransomware investigation we performed. Um, the threat actor group in this case was Black Basta. Black Basta, they formed in about April of this year. Um, when they um, sort of established themselves, they posted on English and Russian speaking forums, essentially looking for uh, initial access into organizations based in Australia, Canada, New Zealand, United States, United Kingdom. So essentially five eyes countries. Um, and since their inception, they've been estimated to have encrypted about 80 victim networks. That's based on numbers of organizations that have been posted on their blog. Um, so if an organization pays, they're not going to be listed. So that number could actually be much higher. On the screen, we've got a quick high level overview of um, the, this particular incident. Uh, it only took them 14 hours from that initial phishing email being sent out um, to escalating their privileges, getting domain admin and um, disabling tools, finding out how backups work and finally deploying the ransomware, encrypting the organization. And we'll talk a little bit more about these steps in detail. So this is the phishing email that was sent to them. It was essentially a link to a Google Drive file um, and the password for that file was contained within the email. And the reason that threat actors do this is because Google will inspect files that are hosted on Google Drive. So if it sees it's malicious, it's going to scan it and remove it. Um, so by password protecting it, Google can't see into it. That file was a, a zip file, so items 6811.zip, and that contained one file in it, which is a link file. So a link file is essentially a shortcut file. You'll have links um, and shortcuts on your desktop, so Outlook, Google Chrome, uh, but link files can also be used in a malicious manner, which is what we've got down the bottom here. That's the command that this particular link file uh, would execute. And essentially what this would do would execute command prompts, uh, it would create a folder, reach out online and download a DLL file and then execute that DLL file, uh, which was identified to be Matt and Buka's, uh, initial access malware. So we got the patient zero machine and did a forensic acquisition of it and analyzed that. And from that, we're able to confirm that the user did reach out to that particular URL. They downloaded that file, which was saved in their downloads. Uh, and we also saw a subsequent execution of the command prompt ping and curl, which we all saw in the, the link command there as well to show that it did execute. The, for command and control, uh, the threat actors use Cobalt Strike. Um, they deployed that on the, the first machine. So Cobalt Strike is a, an adversary simulation tool. Um, it essentially provides command and control with a whole bunch of other functionality, like dumping passwords and password hashes. Uh, and you can exfiltrate data, but essentially you're, you're issuing commands to the workstation where the Cobalt Strike has been deployed and you're getting the responses back. So when they got that initial foothold on the machine, they were just a low privilege user and we saw them um, escalating their privileges to a, a local administrator. And they did this by using an event viewer, UAC bypass, they actually used uh, proof of concept code that was just on GitHub um, and then just ran the PowerShell script and they got it. Uh, but essentially, once they were local administrator, they could do a bit more on that machine. They're able to dump password hashes, 
And in this particular case, they were able to dump uh, domain admin password hash. Um, we got that hash and gave that to the red team. They cracked it within a couple of seconds using a popular word list and rule set to show that it wasn't a very strong password. So essentially, once they had that, they had the keys to the kingdom, they were able to move throughout the network. So they moved to servers within the environment. Uh, they um, put Cobalt Strike on those as well to get hands-on keyboard on those and started to understand what defenses were in this environment. So they were using Windows Defender, some other AV tooling as well. They just disabled that. Um, they had the privileges to do that and got an understanding of how backups were being done by this organization. So they were using uh, Veeam backup replication. Um, they just used Veeam shell to delete all of the Veeam backups. They also um, deleted the scheduled backups as well in case anything was backed up before they got a chance to deploy their ransomware. Finally, you've got impact. So this was them actually deploying that ransomware in the environment. So they used PS exec to push it out to all powered on servers and workstations in the network. That ransomware binary executed, went through the file system and essentially made uh, a large subset of files inaccessible for users. Um, they also identified that the organization was using ESXi or hypervisors for their servers. And they had an ESXi variant as well. Uh, which they deployed on those hypervisors and that encrypted the uh, VMDKs or the virtual hard drives of those machines, um, which makes it very difficult to uh, perform an analysis on because um, we're not able to even see into those disks. When the ransomware was run on those machines as well, um, we changed all the backgrounds. So that's what we've got the screenshot of here, uh, essentially saying that they've been encrypted and to look at the ransom note uh, for the next instruction. Pass over to Jack to talk about how organizations can protect themselves from these kind of attacks. Yeah, so look, there's nothing groundbreaking here. Um, a lot of the time, it's simple stuff that organizations can do, but I'll break it down a bit into a few different categories here. So how we like to break it down at Trisco Labs is into three major categories for where protections should be implemented. This is across people, process, and technology, uh, but it's important to note to a strong defense in depth approach to security will also include implementing protections at each stage as each stage of the attack uh, chain that we've just talked about that Richard just went through, right? This is to say that you need mitigations in place at the initial access boundary of your network, but then you have to assume that a threat actor might gain access to the network too. You need mitigations in place to prevent lateral movement, to prevent privilege escalation, um, you need to make sure things are segregated, your sensitive data is segregated, your backups are segregated, right? And you need to make sure monitoring is in place so that you can see if anything happens. Essentially, it's all just to slow the threat actor down here because as a lot of people I'm sure know, most protections can be bypassed in one way or another, but by making yourself not the low hanging fruit and by giving yourself time, particularly if monitoring is in place, you can heavily reduce the impact that can happen here. Uh, if you have holes, if your network's like Swiss cheese, right, then they're able to do it within 24 hours, could be before you even wake up the next day that you find your network has been ransomed. So some of the major takeaways as a result of this talk and as a result of the data that we've collected, the first one's pretty easy, you know, multi-factor authentication. You can understand why this is important for the business email compromise attacks we talked about. Even though it can be bypassed, it can certainly reduce the risks associated with it. It's one layer of what should be a defense in depth approach. But if we talk about ransomware, then you know we mentioned RDP, for example. Um, you can also gain initial access through legitimate credentials and credential stuffing. So multi-factor authentication on a VPN is also critical. Uh, that can also prevent you know persistence techniques that an attacker might set up in the network. Ensuring you have a tested and segregated backup procedure. So segregation is obviously important. If you have great backups, but they're not segregated, the ransomware will simply encrypt them. However, more and more these days, we're seeing threat actors actually actively looking for the backups and becoming quite effective at it. We had an example recently 
where there were two sources of backups for the network. There were some hosted on a NAS, and then some completely segregated within the cloud. Unfortunately, the credentials for that cloud account were stored in a text file on a share, right? So it's not the best procedure I've ever seen. Um, you need to test this too, right? So you need to make sure that your backups can actually be used uh, to restore your data. You need to ensure there's a procedure in place. Restricting and monitoring your external footprint, it's really important to understand what you have exposed to the internet so that you can continuously test this, monitor it. Um, footprint monitoring is important because eventually you might expose something that you don't mean to. Um, this is monitoring of the external attack surface. Uh, it should go without saying that insecure services such as RDP, for example, shouldn't be exposed in the first place. Use a VPN instead. Patching is critical. Uh, people in this room might have seen recently the Australian Cybersecurity Annual Threat Report for the previous year. Uh, one of the major trends coming out of the report that they've seen is threat actors are becoming faster and faster at weaponizing the exploitation of publicly disclosed vulnerabilities. So a vulnerability like Log4j example will be dropped and made public and threat actors are quickly weaponizing this to gain access to as many networks in, as possible in as short a time as possible to make as much money as possible. So prioritizing external is important, but don't ignore the internal when you're patching as well. Um, because like I said, defense in depth is crucial. Penetration testing, same endpoint detection and response. These all form part of a good security program. But I think the main takeaway from that dot point is that you kind of need someone monitoring these alerts 24 by seven, right? Partially because of the time, time difference, Russians operate while we're asleep, right? That's just their business day. Um, and also because in a lot of cases, we actually saw even when it was, you know, not your top of the line AV, alerts would still be popped when these networks were compromised, but no one was really looking at them. So, you know, sometimes it's days before it's actually been noticed. And by that point, it's too late. So if you are deploying tools that pop alerts, you need someone in place to respond to those alerts and to notice those alerts to take action quickly. User awareness training is critical. Um, ensuring staff know the risks of cybersecurity, right? Pretty simple stuff. Making them aware of the different kinds of phishing attacks and how it can impact them, but also encouraging staff to just practice good security in their everyday lives. There's been examples recently where a lot of personal devices have been compromised. Um, Redline malware, if anyone's heard of that, right? It steals browser credentials. And a lot of the time users will store VPN creds, work-related creds within the browser. And this has been the initial access vector for a lot of high profile breaches recently. And finally, having a good security roadmap. No one's really gonna get security perfect. Uh, it's almost impossible to do, right? But it's so critical to be ahead of the curve to not be that low hanging fruit. And by continuously improving and continuously implementing the right things in place for cybersecurity, right? You can get ahead of the curve and heavily reduce risk. Ensuring you have an instant response plan and actually testing this plan, war games, et cetera, things of that nature. So you know how executives and boards will respond in these situations is crucial as well. So with that, that brings us to the conclusion of the talk. Thank you very much.